Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Media Education Lab. This is the Media Ed Club, and today we're going to be talking about critical discourse studies for media literacy projects. We are joined by the authors of the chapter, uh, Professors uh, Jan Zinkowski and Geoffroy Priyash. Please excuse me for making mistakes in pronunciation. Uh, we are also joined by the editors of the volume, Media Literacy and Media Education Research Methods, Professors Pierre Fastre and Nohmol Um, This is the last uh, webinar that we're doing for this particular edited volume. And I hope you've enjoyed all the other webinars that we've done in this series. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers for today, who've also co-authored this chapter together. Uh, Professor Jan Zinkowski holds a chair in strategic communication at the Department of Information and Communication Science at uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and uh, his wider research interest is in the field of discourse studies, with a focus on political subjectivity reflexivity and critique in society-wide debates. He's also a member of RESIC, Centre de Recherche en Information et Communication at ULB, uh, and an associate researcher of ENGAGE, uh, which is at UC Louvain, uh, Saint Louis, Bruxelles. Um, Professor Geoffrey Patriarch is Professor in Information Communication at UC Louvain, uh, Saint Louis, Bruxelles. He serves as co head of the Master's Program in Communication Strategy in Digital Commerce and as co-head of ENGAGE, uh, the Research Center for Publicness and Contemporary Communication. His research interests lie at the crossroads of audience studies, disinformation studies, and discourse studies. Over to you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I suppose that, uh, okay, great. Well, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, before I get started, I would like to thank uh, uh, the, uh, Pierre and, uh, and Normand for including us and for inviting us to contribute to this um, book chapter of uh, to this book of course uh, uh, because uh, actually it gave uh, Geoffroy my co-author uh, uh, and myself the opportunity also to um, to really make explicit some of the methodological considerations that we consider to be important in conducting a critical discourse study in general so for us for both of us um, an application or the application of uh, say, our brand of critical discourse studies to um, the analysis of a media and information literacy project was actually something new. Eh? And so in that context, uh, it was also a nice experience for us uh, as individual researchers. Now, um, as you can see, um, so we will try to say something about critical discourse studies in general and a type of uh, methodological considerations that um, we think uh, any discourse scholar should take into account when analyzing uh, media or in, in, in information literacy projects. Uh, um, but in doing so, and this is also what we try to do in the chapter, we try to illustrate the type of um, decisions that one could make with reference to a concrete case study uh, in which we made choices of our own, even if other choices are obviously uh, possible uh, in conducting uh, a discourse study. So um, one of the basic ideas uh, in our paper that, that really corresponds, I think, to the introduction that was written by uh, Pierre and Normand uh, is the idea that um, we believe, and this is very much in line with the basic tenets of critical discourse studies, uh, that uh, media education and education in generally, I would say, uh, should be considered as a praxis, uh, which implies, uh, of course, uh, that the practical application, uh, that uh, the um, a praxis conceptualized as the practical application of theoretical knowledge for normative and transformative processes. And the case that I will discuss today, uh, the case of a media and information literacy project called EAVI, uh, um, is actually a very, I think, a very good illustration of uh, a media education process uh, and project, which is really, uh, yeah, involves a very concrete praxis in this sense. Um, uh, another idea I think that uh, our presentation connects with uh, is this idea that media education initiatives 
are often not just initiatives meant to develop certain competences um, uh, among media users, but that are actually also quite often initiatives that responds to certain social and political anxieties. Uh, so as uh, Normand and Pierre uh, already pointed out in their introduction as well, uh, media education programs are often implicit, uh, implicitly or explicitly shaped, of course, by social political projects that justify them uh, in the sense that they focus uh, on aims as diverse as youth protection, social empowerment, citizen participation, productivity and employability, or uh, intercultural dialogue. So um, in our chapter, we basically uh, propose an approach, an approach known as critical discourse studies, uh, as one possible framework for analyzing these social, political, and ideological dimensions of mill projects. Um, AAVI, so that's the, 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 the organization we decided to focus on. It's an organization that, well, the, the ac whose acronym stands for European Association of Viewers' Interests. So it's an institution linked to the European Union, European Commission. Um, and in its um, yeah, uh, mission, uh, it describes that its responsibility uh, uh, that it carries a responsibility which they consider to be essential for modern day citizenship. And so to, they consider that in today's digitized societies, making sense of the media landscape and learning to navigate it uh, is, of, is an essential competence, so to say. Uh, and they continue and they, they really emphasize and articulate this notion of citizenship with a particular notion of media literacy in explaining that, uh, yeah, um, the cap um, that a capacity for digital citizenship uh, is required uh, uh, and that one um, that this uh, that is implies uh, that one is in need, of course, uh, of a quality media literacy education, uh, uh, not only for its own sake, but also for purposes of civic engagement. Uh, uh, and to ensure that digital citizenship is attainable by all members of society, media literacy programs, according to EAVI, must include and reflect the most vulnerable segments of society. So there are a lot of statements already in this little excerpt that showed that um, the importance of media literacy is advocated for by making reference uh, to political ideas, ideas about citizenship, ideas about uh, society um, being a heterogeneous entity that includes vulnerable segments and so on that need to be reinforced in terms of citizenship, knowledge and competences. Uh, they go on. And so it's a European association of viewers' interests, uh, uh, which implies, of course, an association with, in this case, the, the European Union. And in their statement, uh, um, in their self-presentation, we see uh, that um, they also make this link explicit. And Iavi writes that the EU is an extraordinary and unprecedented political, humanitarian, economic, and social experiment. Uh, um, of which one cannot say that the EU is perfect, eh? but even if it's not perfect, and eh, they say, well, its enormous advantages are often taken for granted. Eh? Uh, and then they mention some examples uh, of advantages given by the EU and um, or some realizations of the EU, eh? from free roaming on phones to ensure peace and economic stability on a continent historically prone to devastating and near constant war and conflict, uh, uh, they emphasize that uh, media literacy will be particular, of particular importance. Uh, and they state that it is through AAV's campaign that we will show you that even if EU is not perfect, it's the best idea we've had so far. So we're dealing with a media and information literacy project, which is not only about developing media literacy, but also about communicating a particular idea of Europe eh, and of communicating a particular um, yeah, uh, message concerning the importance of this political entity. Now, why then should we analyze this initiative, uh, EAVI's initiatives, uh, initiative of media literacy uh, uh, from a CDS perspective? Well, there are several reasons for this. Uh, you could argue that critical discourse studies and its toolboxes uh, can be used to design um, uh, media literacy projects. And eh? you could say that the different notions and terms and concepts 
offer useful tools for um, developing curricula, sensitizing people to mediatized discourses. But we try to do something else in our chapter, and we really tried to to use um, insights from critical discourse studies to tell us something about the discourses constitutive of mill initiatives, such as those of EAVI itself. Um, and so what we basically do in our article is basically proposing a list of seven methodological considerations that we believe you should take into account as a critical discourse scholar, uh, interested in an analysis of the political and ideological dimensions of mill projects, uh, such as those of AIV. Uh, so specifically applied to this case study, uh, we would say that our brand of CDS, and it's really a very particular brand of CDS, is really designed to answer uh, research questions such as, uh, okay, what capacity, skills, or forms of awareness does AIV value and stimulate? And more importantly, perhaps even, uh, what notions of citizenship, politics, and democracy does AIV rearticulate in its discourses about media literacy? Uh, and what forms of critique do they promote, do they not promote uh, in the process? And so our point is basically that mill projects, of course, they, they often promote media-related competences and skills, um, but they also invite media users to develop spe uh, specific forms of critique, and what that we would argue also specific forms of political subjectivity. Yeah? And so CDS, Critical Discourse Studies, um, offers um, a whole list, a whole set of frameworks, basically, for analyzing uh, such projects um, and, and enables an analysis of the way AAVI articulates what we call mill-related signifiers and practices constitutive of a preferred mode of subjectivity as well as an associated social political project. So this is a bit dense, but we will try to unpack this in the coming uh, slides. Now, uh, over here, you see the, the seven considerations, uh, methodological considerations that we believe any discourse scholar should take into account while uh, crafting a research design. Um, these are seven considerations. They do not offer solutions, but rather points of attention that one needs to in take into account with respect to the construction of a problematic, the collection of of the data or corpus construction uh, and the way in which you would analyze these data. So um, before I start to explain these different, um, um, say, uh, uh, considerations, these seven methodological considerations, perhaps I should mention a couple of things about critical discourse studies, as I guess that not everybody will be familiar with this approach. So CDS is basically an umbrella term, I would say, to really refer to a, a whole set of uh, uh, approaches to discourse that you will find across the disciplines. Um, uh, so it refers to transdisciplinary domain of uh, both very theoretical abstract approaches to discourse, such as those developed by Michel Foucault or Ernesto Laclau, Chantal Mouffe, abstract philosophies of discourse, if you like, but sometimes also, uh, but we will also find discourse scholars who really have developed and very specific terminologies and frameworks for analyzing concrete interactions, texts, uh, multimodal discourse, and so on, uh, from a more linguistic or textual perspective. The CBS kind of refers to the whole set of approaches uh, developed in, in this domain. And so critical discourse uh, scholars, um, discourse scholars who develop a critical perspective, they would also be interested in the reproduction, contestation, and delegitimation of power relationships through discourse. Um, now, CDS, because of its complexity, because of the wide range of approaches that you will find in that domain, uh, uh, forces scholars to make a choice for particular perspectives and approaches uh, um, in any research design that may develop. And uh, Geoffroy Patriarch and myself, so we opted for a specific set of approaches. On the one hand, we relied on uh, what is known as Essex-style discourse theory. So this is a post-structuralist approach to discourse, more um, stemming from political philosophy. On the other hand, uh, we also worked with more linguistically oriented approaches uh, uh, stemming from uh, an approach called linguistic pragmatics. 
So what is important to know here is that this combination of approaches kind of forced us um, to work with a very specific notion of discourse. So when we talk about discourse, we're not just talking about language use. Uh, for us, a discourse is first and foremost a practice of articulation. And articulation is defined as you can see it on, on this slide here. So we consider an articulation to be a performative discursive practice through which social actors try to fix the meanings of self, other, and society. And so what do we do when we articulate statements? Well, we basically establish links between discursive elements, and these can be linguistic, for instance, words or sentences, but also non-linguistics. So it could be images, symbols, practices, etc., uh, um, through sentences, statements, narratives, and so on. So uh, and practice of articulation is a way of connecting disparate, disparate um, distinct um, semiotic elements to one another in a way that will impact on the meaning of each signifier, each semiotic element involved. Um, and to us, uh, practice of articulation is ultimately about fixing meanings, which is fundamentally a political practice, because these meanings get fixed, of course, in struggles over meaning in which different social actors try to make sense of social reality. Uh, one important caveat uh, here is that with this understanding of discourse, it is impossible to arrive at a true or essential meaning of a word, a concept, and so on. So it, it's a perspective that will very much emphasize the inherent polyphony of every discourse. Now, um, so this notion of discourse as articulation builds on so-called Essex approach to discourse. And we thought that this would be a very suitable approach to analyze the discourse of Eavi, and in order to answer or or to explore our problematic because, um, yeah, uh, we were interested in this articulation, this connection basically between media literacy related notions and concepts on the one hand and notions of citizenship and critique on the other hand. So we're interested in the articulation of different sets of signifiers. Huh? And so even in, we already saw a couple of quotes from the way Eavi presents itself, but even in Eavi's logo, as you can see, uh, there's this articulation of notions of media literacy, citizenship, and Europeanness, because the E in Eavi stands for European. Uh, it's a European Association for Viewers' Interests. So on the one hand, we built on um, this abstract notion of discourse as an articulatory practice, but we also build on linguistic pragmatics, which is basically a more linguistic textual approach to discourse, which basically defines discourse uh, as basically language use in concrete contexts. Uh, uh, and it's an approach that will draw attention to the fact that the discourses that people articulate or organizations articulate, that people can articulate these with at least a minimal degree of awareness, basically, and reflexivity. And so by combining these two approaches, uh, uh, we think we can shed light on the type of subjectivity promoted by AIV. Uh, so um, we, and we thereby understand subjectivity as a way of relating oneself to a reality that can only be made, send of, made sense of in and through discourse. Uh, so to us, subjectivity, political subjectivity, involves an imperfect reflexive awareness of the discourses, practices, and processes that constitute our sense of self. So by combining these two uh, approaches and this particular understanding of this, developing this particular understanding of discourse as articulation, it becomes possible to ask a set of research questions. And this is something that we wanted to emphasize. So if you choose for a particular approach in discourse studies, the particular concept of discourse that you will work with will have an impact on all subsequent choices that you will have to make in a research design. And this starts already with the uh, type of research questions that you will develop. So if you work with the notion of discourse defined as an articulatory practice, then you have to ask yourself, okay, what type of articulations, what type of connections do I want to explore? And in our case, uh, so we would be interested in what we call media and information literacy related signifiers. So that means labels, uh, words such as media literacy, critique, citizenship, and so on. And the way they get articulated with each other, as well as with other elements in Eavi's texts. Uh, uh, other types of research questions that we could ask based on the notion of discourse articulation would include 
what forms of political subjectivity are being constructed through mill discourses articulating mill related signifiers such as media literacy citizenship and critique eh? or another one even eh? what forms and modes are critique and what sort of european society does eavi articulate an advocate in the process so um the question then, of course, is once you have such a research question, how you would go about uh, to identify um, different discourses circulating in society. And there it's essential, I think, to uh, make a, dis uh, that's what we argue in the text at least, to make a distinction between the discourses circulating in society and the discourses that you will find within your corpus, uh, uh, within your data collection. And so, um, yeah, and here, um, so of course, like in basically all forms of research, you would probably start out with a literature, literature review, but a literature review in a critical discourse study will be interpreted quite often as basically an exploration of academic discourses already in circulation. So the way uh, you will do is basically that you will start with a literature review in which you will try to identify how other actors in the public sphere, and these can be academics, but also politicians and organizations, how they've problematized the, the object of investigation uh, before you started to get interested into this question. So what you will basically do is to try to problematize how others have problematized the topic under investigation, in our case, Mill. Eh? So uh, mill initiatives, uh, they, um, the, the idea is basically that mill initiatives, well, they acquire, of course, only sense uh, in a wider discursive field where competing discourses try to fix the meaning of what media and information literacy is. Uh, and mapping this discursive field um, is really an essential task for anyone doing research on such projects. So uh, for different reasons, for one thing, such a literature review that allows you to map the, the field eh, will make it easier later on to name the discourses that you will find in your data collection, in the corpus that you investigate. Uh, it may also help you to contextualize the statements in the corpus under investigation. And of course, and this is also very important, your corpus is only a selection, of course, of all possible discourses that are circulating in society. So this type of literature review, this mapping of the discursive field related to media and information literacy will also enable you to identify absences and omissions in your corpus or in your case study. So what notions of media literacy are not present in your corpus? That's at least as important as figuring out what is present in your uh, corpus. So uh, a literature review of academic discourses provides a good starting point for an exploration of the discursive field of mill, but it may not suffice. Uh, of course, there are other entities, not only academics, who write about mill, who develop mill initiatives. So you would also, it would also make sense to include uh, an exploration of the different uh, discourses produced by organizations, educational actors, policymakers, and so on, who also want to have a say in what uh, media and information literacy is all about. Now, in the construction of um, uh, or problematic, and in our attempt to identify the discourses already in circulation, um, uh, you will try to map out the field. And in our case, we try to map out the field because we were interested in the ideas concerning citizenship and critical awareness that were uh, being advocated in this literature. Now, I will not expand too much about this for, for time uh, because of reasons of time, uh, um, but um, in our mapping of the field, and there are different other mappings possible, of course, uh, we distinguished in the literature, in the academic literature, between uh, so-called critical versus non-critical approaches to media and information literacy, whereby the critical, uh, well, the non-critical approaches would basically um, treat mill as a pro politically neutral set of tools, competences, and practices, where and where the more critical approaches uh, would try to uh, give a political purpose, an emancipatory or a politicizing. Uh, uh, objective uh, uh, to uh, lend a political objective to uh, media and information literacy projects. Uh, 
Uh, a second tension that kind of partially overlaps with the first one uh, would be then also a distinction between what you could consider utilitarian versus holistic milk concepts, whereby the utilitarian approaches would basically treat milk as a set of skills um, for, for instance, useful for, for instance, employment and employability. And whereas the more holistic approaches really see mill as a more, um, yeah, um, um, holistic activity that will impact eh, on individuals' uh, sense of self, citizenship, uh, sense of critique, etc. So uh, once you've done a mapping, eh, as you would do in most forms of uh, research where you would conduct a, 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 a literature review, um, there's of course the question of data collection. Eh? Um, and in the case of critical discourse studies, uh, well, you do not necessarily need to work with qualitative methods, but qualitative methods are often used. And when they are used, as was the case in our project, uh, you, of course, need to ask yourself, OK, um, uh, okay I'm focusing on a particular case, case of Eavi, for instance. But what is this case a case of? Uh, and then there are multiple selection strategies that you will have to put into place, like in any social scientific project. Uh, you may opt for typical cases. Uh, uh, you may opt for extreme or deviant cases. You may want to uh, deploy a strategy of treating uh, a variety of cases uh, in order to be able to contrast uh, different uh, cases of media and information literacy, for instance. Uh, and these selection strategies, of course, they may very well also be informed by more practical considerations that have to do with the accessibility of data, the feasibility of data collection analysis, uh, the resources that you have at your disposal, etc. But these are really generic considerations. Um, um, if we focus on EAVI and our reasons for having selected this case, uh, uh, we have to emphasize that we really considered Eavi uh, that we had at least we we had strong indications from the outset uh, that Eavi was an organization that would be a typical case of an organization developing a media and information literacy program in relation articulated with uh, a preferred mode of politics and subjectivity. Uh. Uh, some of these indications you can see here on this slide that uh, to begin with, yeah, it's an organization that explicitly describes itself as an international nonprofit organization in Brussels advocating media literacy and full citizenship. So there are clearly political objectives um, integrated into its mission. Um, ARV is also uh, relevant for um, investigating the political dimension of its mill projects and the slogan of AAV, media literacy for citizenship is also indicative of this. And uh, also another reason for selecting this case is that AAV produced a lot of materials and is involved also in a wide range of initiatives that are really at the crossroads of research, education and European public policies. Uh, at the more practical level, then, um, it should be noticed, or it's useful to notice at least, that EAVI produces many different types of discourse. Uh, uh, it produces opinion articles, or it publishes public opinion articles, it makes videos uh, uh, at the crossroads, once again, of academic policy and educational discourses. Uh, it publishes most of its documents in English. Uh, and these documents, on top of that, are uh, published online and accessible for free. Now, uh, of course, when you construct a corpus, and if you're interested in identifying different types of um, yeah, discourses about media literacy within that corpus, you have to make sure that the data that you will work with, that you have good reasons, that you will find traces of these discourses in your data sets. Uh, and an important caveat there is that um, in critical discourse studies, uh, uh, scholars are generally very much aware of the fact that no corpus, no data set will ever exhaust the complexity of a discursive field. And this raises the question, okay, when you want to identify discourses, what sort of discourses do you want to, to identify? What type of boundaries do you want to draw between different types of discourse? Eh? How, do, how can you draw also um, boundaries around a, disc, a discourse? Is that, is that possible in the first place? Eh? Um, and what type of boundaries would this be? Huh? Now, um, this is a question that was described by Foucault as a problem of the 
the unity or unities of discourse and so it is possible to uh, identify different unities of discourse using a distinct set of criteria so for instance applied to mill you could say that you could try to identify discourses uh, or distinguish between discourses based on the type of knowledge and practices that these discourses produce for instance you could say okay there is an academic mill discourse there's a policy mill discourse there's a pedagogic mill discourse could also try to distinguish between discourses based on the entities that produce them. Uh, so, uh, for instance, you could say, okay, there are academic institutions producing discourse. There are discourses may, uh, uttered or articulated by policymakers, by public intellectuals, by mill practitioners, etc. You may want to distinguish between uh, different types of mill discourse based on the genre convention, conventions shaping mediatized statements. So for instance, perhaps you're only interested in scientific discourses about mill course materials, uh, advocacy papers, policy documents, opinion articles, uh, you name it. Um, aside from the more banal or mundane uh, types of discourse that, that you could distinguish between uh, based on criteria of uh, time, period, language, medium, etc. Um, but whatever type of boundary that you draw, try to draw around your discourse, uh, uh, these boundaries will prove to be very open, very fluid, very, and, and it's quite often the case that these boundaries will prove to be quite um, artificial, so to say. So a uh, basic starting point shared by almost all approaches in, in, in critical discourse studies is that discourses are inherently heterogeneous and polyphonic. Uh, and so if you consider the case of the discourse uh, that you will find on EA, in EAV's documents and websites, uh, then it becomes quickly obvious that Eavi's discourse is not only or exclusively the discourse owned by Eavi. Eh? So on its website, for instance, you will find voices of other actors, uh, um, also in its publications, eh? voices that are being referred to both implicitly and explicitly without necessarily endorsing them. Eh? Just to give you an example, um, Eavi has posted on its website uh, many links to videos, uh, embedded videos uh, that you uh, that are taken from YouTube, uh, which, which deal with, uh, which offer critical analyses of the media, of media contents, of media institutions, uh, produced by, uh, or at least figuring intellectuals such as Noam Chomsky, or critical documentaries about propaganda produced by the BBC uh, uh, and Alan Curtis. Uh, uh, but these videos are not necessarily representing the views of EAV, even if EAV gives rearticulates them, uh, provides hyperlinks, uh, and acknowledges um, their existence. Um, so um, on top of that, the ARV website also contains many does contain also uh, these documents produced by AIV itself. So it has produced its own videos, its own pedagogic materials, standpoints, and so on, as well as documents written by public intellectuals and other commentators who are given simply a platform on their website. Now, constructing our, our data sets, eh, we decided to focus on uh, the previous version of EAVI's website, because in the meantime, they've updated their, their site. Uh, and we worked with a rather limited corpus, a data set of about 70 documents that contained uh, all web pages and documents uh, containing at least one occurrence of a mill related signifier. By this, we mean so when we talk about media and information literacy, it's not necessarily the case that I use this exact term. We also included texts uh, that talked about media literacy, digital literacy, data literacy, and other forms of literacy, basically. Uh, um, we also included um, documents that AIV labeled uh, as blog posts uh, between 2020 and 2019. Uh, on the condition that these posts also included mill-related signifiers. Um, uh, and on top, on top of that, we included four videos, uh, so not just only texts in the classical sense of the word, uh, uh, for which we created transcripts that we then analyzed uh, for, uh, uh, on the basis of its texts, but also its uh, audiovisual dimension. Um, uh, and so this implies that we also excluded lots of materials. So for instance, these videos are containing comments and analyses by external actors such as Noam Chomsky or documentaries of 
Adam, Adam Curtis uh, produced initially for the BBC about propaganda. Well, they were not included because we did not consider them to be necessarily representative of Eavi's official mill discourse, even if it does acknowledge their existence. Now, uh, the question then is, once you've created a corpus like this, uh, any critical discourse scholar will have to ask him or herself, okay, but we have this corpus now containing textual material, audiovisual material, perhaps. What shall we focus on? Eh? Uh, at what level shall we analyze uh, these texts? And um, here it's important to realize that um, discourses, of course, can be analyzed at multiple levels of structure. It's possible to develop fine-grained analyses focusing on word choice, on the way sentences are constructed, the way argumentative patterns are articulated, the way narratives are being told, uh, and uh, or perhaps you're interested in intertextual structures even. And this is just... Uh, these are just a couple of levels of structure that you could potentially be interested in. And it, it's obvious that you cannot focus on all of these levels simultaneously. So um, what then uh, should be the form, discursive forms and functions that should be the, the, the primary focus for your analysis? And uh, yeah, um, there are a couple of criteria that you could use. Um, you could say, well, uh, to begin with, of course, what you decide to focus on uh, or not should be decided in function of your research question, obviously, but other criteria could be coherence. So for instance, perhaps there are certain aspects and levels of discourse that allowed you, uh, that allowed the documents under investigation to cohere. So for instance, if you're interested in media literacy, um, perhaps if there are certain metaphors that are being used systematically, these metaphors may shed light on the way the organization conceptualizes uh, what media literacy is all about. Uh, if certain, there's also the criterion of uh, recurrence. When discursive elements reappear within or across documents in a systematic fashion, well, then, of course, you, you have good reason that these to, to suspect that these signifiers will be of particular importance. Um, um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, in a discourse study, especially a qualitative discourse study, it will probably be necessary to focus on different aspects of meaning, uh, different uh, forms and functions. And the question is to make a good selection that offers you with primary entry points into your data set. Um, so uh, then is the question of this raises the question, of course, OK, faced with a collection of texts, long texts, short texts, uh, texts containing audiovisual materials, uh, um, what are the units of analysis that you will focus on? Eh? And so uh, in our case, eh, uh, we decided to investigate the way Eavi articulated mill signifiers with concepts of citizenship and critique. And so we were primarily interested in um, rather not just in specific wordings, but in larger text segments. So mostly we coded initially um, sentence, entire sentences, sometimes collections of sentences, paragraphs that contained implicit or explicit descriptions or definitions of notions such as media literacy, citizenship, or critique. Uh, uh, when we're dealing with um, images and scenes in audiovisual data uh, or with transcripted video, uh, well, in those cases, we would also uh, select scenes or segments uh, um, in which the meaning of particular mill signifiers, critique, and citizenship uh, would be uh, fixed or uh, yeah, in, 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 yeah, in, in particular statements. Um, and once you've done so, there's a question, of course, once you have selected the relevant segments that you want to analyze, well, um, what aspects of these statements will you focus on? Will you focus on word choice, on labels, on metaphors, on argument, arguments, narratives, uh, and so on? What, what will you be focusing on? Um, and so in order to figure this out, we basically developed a discourse study in two phases. In the first phase, uh, we started with what's not a discourse study, properly speaking. So we did a type of inductive coding that you could also find in, in other qualitative approaches, ranging from qualitative content analysis to constructivist forms of uh, grounded theory, for instance. Uh, 
And so um, in this coding cycle, what we did uh, uh, was that we focused on our corpus, um, which we uploaded to a software program called the DOOS, which is a qual analysis, uh, the software program for qualitative analysis. And we coded our unit seven analysis. And so these statements, these sentences, these paragraphs, these um, scenes from the video that, that we analyzed uh, inductively. Uh. But what's important here is that when we coded these segments, that we saw these codes uh, as basically acts of rearticulation. So every time that we apply a code to a data or a part of our data set, well, we basically articulate this code with an act of interpretation on our side with a theoretical concept perhaps. And so every act of coding, at least within our paradigm, our approach to discourse was considered as an act of rearticulation and recontextualization. So coded elements, they were labeled and linked with each other in overarching categories, generating new meanings in the process. Now it's important to emphasize that critical discourse studies do not require coding. Uh, not all, uh, discourse scholars code their data in this way, uh, but we nevertheless were convinced that this, and remain convinced that this is a useful preliminary step that facilitates um, the actual discourse analysis and in discourse analytical work that, um, that will be uh, at the core of the analysis, basically. So um, just to give you an idea of what is implied, this first phase of coding, uh, well, so we coded text segments and video transcripts in the first round of coding uh, in a way that allows us, allowed us to identify and distinguish between different types of statements about liter media literacy, citizenship, and critique. So here on the left type of the screen, you see, for instance, part of our coding tree. Uh, um, in, in, in blue over here, and eh, you see uh, a series of mill related signifiers that we were interested in. Uh, you see critique, you see citizenship, uh, democracy also, um, was a, was a notion that we were interested in, uh, and literacy, eh, or the different forms of mill, eh, uh, related literacy, uh, were also of interest to us. And so we start really from the bottom up. So the purple codes that you see there, so media literacy, digital literacy, film literacy, information literacy, and so on. Well, um, these were really based. Um, so anytime a text contained any of these notions, uh, we basically labeled it. And later on, we grouped them together in this category of literacy. So the, and this enabled us basically to provide, a, to develop an, a bird's eye view of the different notions of literacy that were explicitly being articulated, uh, the signifiers that were being articulated within this text. And we did similar things for citizenship and critique. So for instance, um, uh, and then uh, secondly, sorry, secondly, um, we we looked for also, we not, we're not only interested in whether or not the text um, articulated these signifiers, but we were also interested in the implicit and explicit definitions and descriptions of for instance, media and information literacy. Eh? So for instance, if you take a look at the table here on, on the left, eh, so the, the coding tree, you will see that um, there was a whole set of um, codes eh, uh, that we were able to group uh, as uh, mill as necessary for society. So a lot of statements argued for mill as something essential to society. And within that category, we would find uh, texts, uh, co uh, codes such as mill is essential to society or necessary for society because it is important to multicultural society, because it is a civilizational issue, because it is a precondition for trust in EU institutions, and so on and so forth. But we always work from the bottom up, starting with the purple codes, then grouping them together into families uh, uh, of, of, of codes, so to say. Um, Professor? Similar thing or apply the similar strategy to, for instance, uh, concepts of citizenship uh, and also to different concepts of critique. Uh, so it's really a lots of coding, uh, uh, but it's not yet a discourse analysis proper. This coding is really a preliminary step that helps us to really um, systematically address the research question uh, that is of real interest to us and a properly discourse analytical research question, which goes as follows. Uh, how does Eavi articulate a preferred mode of subjectivity and society within its discourse? Um, 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 Professor, I'm afraid we only have five more minutes to wrap up okay. your talk. 
that should that should work i think um so um here um so we were interested in uh, not just making a list of different notions of media literacy and critique and citizenship, but really wanted to understand uh, how these signifiers in the end feed into a particular idea of what type of subjectivity Eavi wants to pursue and, and what type of society it wants to advocate and, and, and realize throughout its different uh, media and information literacy initiatives. Uh, so we were basically interested in the political and ideological dimensions of Eavi's discourse. And it's in exploring these dimensions that we enter into the domain of critical discourse studies, properly speaking. Uh, now, in, what's important to know is that when we talk about ideology and the ideological dimension of discourse, we do not claim to uncover some type of hidden meaning. Uh, we talk about ideology basically as a social and political and interpretive function of discourse that allows subjects to imagine social reality and to justify or challenge specific injustices or inequalities. So the idea is that we cannot escape ideology, but that it is possible to become reflexively aware of the way ideology informs our identity statements practices in a reflexive way. So ideology in that sense basically always and necessarily informs our sense of self, other, and society. And so these coded segments that we identified in the first part of our analysis, they're basically meant to help us answer the discourse analytical question, what performative functions, uh, articulations, distinct articulations of male citizenship critique perform in relation to Eavi's preferred modes of politics and society. And so here, um, the conclusions that we draw in our analysis, uh, or that we what we were able to see in our analysis, was that Eavi, okay, um, it does advocate particular forms of critique. It even acknowledges radical forms of critique, such as those of Chomsky. But it will not really advocate integrate these radical forms of critique, this critique of capitalism and so on, for instance, within its own preferred mode of subjectivity. On the other hand, the type of uh, milk that it does advocate is a type of holistic approach to mill whereby media and information literally seen as a transformative project that can uh, that can transform individuals and that will have an impact on the way an individual operates in society so it's a holistic approach that goes beyond seeing mill as just a, a set of competences and skills um, it does uh, include an awareness of the way media shape people's lives uh, and a heightened degree of reflexivity with respect to one's own political beliefs, biases, and rational limitations. Um, and when thinking about critique, uh, Eavi advances the notion of mill, which is all about a kind of imposing a kind of self-discipline in dealing with the media in an attempt to overcome different forms of bias. Uh, and so what's really important here is that Eavi thinks, uh, proposes a mode of critique which at first sight almost seems kind of ideologically neutral in the sense that it basically tries to offer a type of reflexivity, um, tries to foster a type of um, yeah, reflexivity, which does not really problematize all types of ideology. Um, so we do not claim that Eavi is ideologically neutral. In fact, Eavi, but we do claim that Eavi um, does not recognize its own contingency or the political dimension of its own project in its own discourse. Uh, here you see a couple of images of one of these uh, videos that Eavi produced. And uh, it's a video that I, that I invite you to watch uh, in which um, uh, they rely on a metaphor of a little boy who lives on uh, uh, in an information desert basically, and who has to take a journey with a little boat, avoiding the dangers that you can encounter in the world of media in order to reach uh, Media Literacy Island. And so it's a journey, a transformative journey through which, through which uh, Jack, the protagonist of this story, becomes media wise. And so uh, to conclude, uh, the uh, ideological and political dimensions of Eavi's uh, mill discourse, they will crystallize in implicit and explicit assumptions about the way it sees the ideal European society. Uh, so our analysis really showed that um, it preferred the mode of subjectivity, which is very much entangled within a li uh, liberal democratic pro-EU project, uh, uh, which inscribes itself and identifies itself with values such as multiculturalism, diversity, and democracy. 
and which is also explicitly critical of what it labels as extremist forms of nationalism hostile to the EU. Uh, so media literacy in this sense becomes a weapon against such nationalist projects. So MIL is articulated as a tool that facilitates also political participation of EU citizens, but the notion of participation here is usually really rather weak in the sense that they reduce or that they interpret participation as a mode of critical reading, so to say, of media messages. So to conclude with, um, at the methodological level, eh, what we try to show um, by uh, drawing attention to these different methodological considerations for critical discourse studies eh, in the study of Mill, uh, well, uh, we would say that each stage, each stage of a critical discourse study involves or can be interpreted as involving acts of rearticulation whereby new meanings get fixed in partial and provisional ways. Uh, uh, we also wanted to show that mill discourses are dispersed across a multiplicity of media and texts that can belong to different genres. And that, yeah, the way uh, the coherence that we identify in text is sometimes also an effect of the work of the analysts themselves. And our brand of CDS, so which builds on Essex discourse theory and linguistic pragmatics, uh, uh, allows for a form of critique that is not exclusively based on the hermeneutics of suspicion. It does not necessarily try to uncover hidden meanings. Um, it's rather an attempt to explain the forms and functions of a particular discourse, and it allows us to denaturalize uh, this discourse and to facilitate debate over the political dimension of identities, practices, and policies related to Mill. Uh, so we did not seek to delegitimize Mill projects such as those of Yavi, but we would like to draw attention to their contingency and to render explicit their political and ideological implications. Uh, uh, because even if Mill projects do not present themselves as such, uh, they do often involve political projects uh, built on strong ideological assumptions. So thank you very much. Um, I hope this gives you a bit more insight in the way that, or the reasons why we think that CDS Uh-oh, it looks like uh, we've lost uh, Professor Smolowski. Yeah. Um, sorry, we lost the last bit of your conclusion, but that's that's all right. Okay, well. Uh, you're back now. Uh, but what I want to draw, uh, attention to is a little bit of a back and forth that happened in chat and I'm going to request uh, Pierre and Carol to come off mute. Uh, Pierre, you asked a question in chat and Carol, you responded to that question with information from US contexts. I wonder if the both of you could talk about that uh, to sort of help our attendees who will probably look at the recording later to come off mute and on video, if that's comfortable for you, and talk about it a bit. Sure. Um, so my my uh, my initial comment in the in the chat was that um, as CDS has this goal of of analyzing the ideological and political dimension of of um, male project discourses, it kind of shares a, a very broad goal of a lot of critical media literacy education initiatives that, that seek to highlight or to shed light on the ideological dimensions of, of media discourses. And so my, my question was, um, to what extent do you think that CDS is actually a tool for researchers only, because probably because of its complexity, or uh, to what extent do you think it could be used by media educators with various audiences as a means of uh, proceeding to uh, the analysis of a variety of media uh, discourses to highlight uh, the, their political and, and ideological uh, dimensions. Even if in your case, um, the discourses it's, it's sought to analyze were actually media literacy discourses or mis discourses about media literacy, I'm, I'm guessing um, that it could apply to other types of media uh, discourses in a more general way. So could it be used as a media education pedagogy or a media education tool. Uh, and then well, I'll let Carol react to the, the to, to that question. Okay. Um, shall I answer or? Um... No, Carol is just here. Carol, if you could come off mute. I'm, I'm not on mute, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so as a practitioner uh, in, in the, the classroom, um, it's been in, in high schools and then uh, currently 
well, for several years, well, I don't know, 30 years now I've been in higher education, but the climate in America is so uh, diverse. It really depends almost by school or institution. And um, I, I've never felt any fear or discomfort, um, but I have had courses uh, where my textbooks have been looked over by other people before I do it. I teach a course called Media and Society, and I try and get in um, ideology and ideological discourse kind of through the back door, and I call it encoding and decoding. And I try and get, I teach a flipped classroom, so I try to get it coming from the students so that I don't lecture or, or uh, you know, their accusations of proselytizing towards a, a, a particular political party. Sometimes uh, when you are trying to use discourse to analyze a headline, a video, um, a news article. So uh, I don't know if other colleagues have felt that kind of pressure. Uh, now that I'm in Michigan, I feel uh, at my particular institution now, I feel like uh, there's an implicit trust in the classroom and that my administrators have uh, implicit trust in me. And so that's been real freeing. Um, the other thing that um, apart from trying to do critical discourse studies in the classroom is simply, um, and I don't want to say it's post COVID, but increasingly students uh, don't have very many critical thinking skills. So you almost have to um, do baby steps to get them to begin thinking critically generally before you talk about discourse. So that's my experience. And if I could just add to that a little bit, um, before we started the webinar, we were talking about media literacy and media education and how sometimes we have a very solution oriented approach with regards to these things where we feel like there's like a one solution uh, approach for everything There's, it's going to answer all of our questions but we come from very unequal contexts and I, I hear you Carol we have in India censorship beginning to come in our textbooks at the curricular level like from the national council level so it's very frustrating so if the presenters could please respond to these three comments questions um, Geoffroy, I, I shall perhaps start and then, then, uh, yes. I, I propose yeah, okay. that. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, well, um, perhaps we start with this, this first remark by, by Pierre. Eh? Uh, so of course, well, can critical discourse studies be used, um, say in the context of, uh, well, as a tool for, for, for media literacy initiatives, of course, it, and it's also being done, I would say, in, in various contexts. Uh, uh, but, and I guess that this is also what Carol is, is referring to, uh, uh, of course, in the current context where, uh, say, critical approaches in the social sciences in general uh, are sometimes problematized by reactionary politicians, movements, etc. Um, yeah, this is not always uh, an unproblematic type of education to provide. Huh? Uh, so in that sense, it's quite often the type of approach that can be delegitimized, that can be attacked, that can be uh, rendered problematic eh, by uh, different series of contenders. I think this is obviously the case in certain US contexts, but also increasingly in Europe, in, or at least in certain European contexts. And um, there, yeah, I think that it's important to realize that of course, depending on the type of critical discourse studies that you propose, uh, this may be a more or less important issue. So we relied on a particular approach to discourse, Chef Hua and I, which is very much based on post-structuralism, um, which uh, is, uh, yeah, has close connections to uh, also the Frankfurt School, uh, with, with all of these approaches that, that are being criticized by reactionary forces. And of course, yeah, this this can trigger pro problems in certain context, contexts rather than others. Uh, on the other hand, of course, from the moment that you talk about inequalities, power relations, and so on, it will not suffice to simply describe what's going on in texts. And I think that any type of critical discourse analysis in this sense of the word uh, 
will require also a type of social and political analysis. Uh, and um, yeah, there uh, it is not possible, I think, to only train people in, say, critical discourse analysis without offering them uh, a basic way of analyzing power inequalities in society and so on. And in that sense, uh, a type of media education that only focuses on the forms and functions of particular aspects of texts and so on will not suffice to develop the type of critical awareness that perhaps uh, critical discourse scholars would like to see. Uh, and this touches upon, I think, also perhaps on um, part of the remarks that Carol uh, uh, raised, there are issues that Carol raised. Uh, so when Carol um, noticed that the that there's quite often a lack of critical attitudes, uh, basic critical attitude amongst uh, students, uh, um, and that it that we already need to raise critical awareness before we can uh, ask them to critically analyze texts and so on. Uh, um, I think this this is very much linked to another issue that's often overlooked in critical discourse studies, and that's namely the fact that um, yeah. Uh, we not only need to be literate in the sense of uh, being able to read and interpret texts in particular ways, to read between the lines and analyze assumptions, etc., that are being introduced in various ways, but we need to be able to connect this with uh, what what I like to call, at least uh, this is a notion that Chef Wai and I started discussing amongst ourselves, with a notion of ideological literacy. So we need to be able to, to identify different ways uh, between different political projects uh, and their implications, et cetera. And if you're not able to distinguish between these, then of course, to some extent, the tools, the linguistic and textual tools of CDA will remain a bit toothless. Uh, so I think you need both there. Um, and this is not an easy thing. And I think educators, they really have to... Uh, yeah, the people interested in teaching CDS or CDA-related approaches, I think they they are fighting a real battle. In uh, they will have to face a, to fight a real battle in the years to come in educational institutions, in discussions about curricula, etc. And yeah, so at least that's my my uh, response, I would say, to these questions and remarks. Uh, don't know, Jepois, perhaps you. Uh, yeah, I, I think that also what, what might be important to consider here is uh, what, what is on the slide, actually. So the idea that CDS does not only delegitimize mid project, but also render that contingency and implication explicit. I was thinking that you can almost replace CDS by critical media literacy, for instance, and, and mid project by media and, and technology. Um, and so in that sense, critical media literacy, um, when broadly speaking, can also be considered as a way to actually contribute uh, to maintaining a democratic debate on important political social issues. So it's in a way, uh, it's, it's seeing literacy as a way of opening up, yes, debates. Of course, there, there might be different approaches to what, what democratic is, etc. but I find that interesting. It's actually something that is um, elaborated by uh, Marianne Jorgensen and uh, Louis Phillips, if I remember well, in, um, in a book on uh, yeah, discourse analysis where they say that the critical approaches to discourse kind of uh, contribute to yeah maintaining, opening up, opening up the democratic debate. Um, and so this is something that, that might be yeah, useful to think about when, when doing media literacy in classroom, actually. So it, in that way, it's not so much a matter of being, you know, leftist or, or, or right wing or left wing. It's, it's a matter of, you know, trying to, to, to open democratic debate on, on key issues that uh, um, but 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 yeah, it's uh it, it's becoming a very tricky yeah issue uh not only in the U.S. indeed <laughs> yeah. Uh, if if I may add, because this remind me reminds me also Jeff of what you um but you mentioned to me a couple of days back that you had this or in an email that you had the students uh, who uh, asked whether CDA yeah. uh, could be used uh, for right wing political purposes and, uh, and, uh, and forms of analysis. Uh? Mm. Uh, and this is a type of question that we will face, I think, more often in, in the near future. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm afraid this is all the time we have today for this particular presentation. And I'm wondering if for one quick hot minute, the editors could talk about the handbook very quickly. Yeah, please, please go ahead, if you don't mind. Oh, you're muted. 
sorry, didn't see that. Uh, yes, um, well, very, very quickly. Yes, so the the, um, the presentation that you, uh, you attended today or that you're viewing on YouTube uh, is actually part of an edited book, uh, which is focused on research methods for media literacy and media education research. And the, the book actually has three parts. The chapter that we discussed today is part of the third part, which we labeled as being focused on what we call prescriptive discourses, and actually all kinds of discourses that kind of um, shape what media literacy and what media education is today. Um, certainly mill projects as discussed uh, today, but also um, policies um, and, and all kinds of discourses produced by the different types of stakeholders. And then the other two parts of the book are focused on research either on media practices uh, and the variety of practices developed with and through media by um, a variety of, of uh, individuals and communities. And the second part of the book is uh, on the analysis and the study of educational initiatives. And so each part of the book provides five chapters and each chapter provides a thorough explanation and, and uh, detail of how to um, set out to do research with a particular, particular type or brand of method, such as critical discourse analysis, for example, for the, the types of discourse analysis that we saw today. All right, thank you so much. And as far as I'm concerned, I've already added links to chat. You can quickly look at the different kinds of media education lab events on offer. As uh, far as I'm concerned, the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series is wrapping up. We have one coming up in March. Please join us. It's all about conspiracies. And uh, the last one is in April. Uh, which is on post-colonial media studies. And far as the media club is concerned, we are going to be really optimistic for the April Media Ed Club. And as I mentioned, the links are already in chat. Thank you so much for joining us and apologies for going over time. I'm going to stop recording now. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank you so Nina. Mm -hmm. The conspiracy.